Hello. Welcome to Science and Fiction's Cinema in East Tennessee. My name is Shara Lange, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Media and Communication, and I'm also a radio TV program head. And along with my colleagues, Dr. Chelsea Wessels and Dr. Matthew Holtmeyer, um, we organized this symposium because we're passionate about using film as a catalyst for conversation and action. And um, just want to make sure I mention Dr. Wessels and Dr. Holtmeyer are in the Department of Literature and Language, also at ETSU. Uh, so yesterday we had this amazing group of panels, and today, our second and last day of the symposium, is a day of workshops. So we had a design film collaborative community workshop this morning and this is our last event of this really amazing event that we hope will become an annual event and we have an amazing workshop um, we have uh, elan bogarin who's going to do a, a lecture about producing film and branded media um, so before we get to that we just have a couple of housekeeping matters regarding zoom thank you so much for being here um, we really uh, are happy to have you involved so i'll pass the the floor over to dr wessels Great, thank you. And thanks everyone for being here on such a beautiful day. If you are in Johnson City, it's gorgeous out there. Um, so just for those of you that haven't done a webinar before, we are in the webinar format. So if you are an attendee, we cannot see you or hear you, which is nice for you. You don't have to worry about accidentally unmuting yourself or you know, um, appearing on screen accidentally, you won't do that. Um, so please use the chat if you have any comments or want to respond to anything um, that's happening today. And you can also use the Q&A function if you have questions for Alon as she is presenting. So feel free to enter those as the conversation is going. You can just use the Q&A button at the bottom. The other thing I wanna point out about Zoom is we have the live transcript function on. So if you click that live transcript button at the bottom and choose show subtitles, you can have closed captioning for this today. And it's actually pretty good. So if you prefer to consume your media with um, text alongside, feel free to turn that on and use it. I think that's um, that's all for me. Thank you. Um, so I'm so pleased to have Dr. Frank Canedo here, who's going to uh, present and introduce Elan. And um, Dr. Canedo is uh, Dean of Humanities at Northeast State Community College. And thank you so much for being here, friend. Well, thank you for having me. You know, video, oh, the wonders of Zoom, video <laughs> and audio. Uh, I am here to uh, present Elan. Um, thank you, Shara, for, for inviting me. Um, Elan Bogarin uh, has an extensive bio and you can read it on the page, but I'm gonna give you some highlights. Uh, her feature, 306 Hollywood, premiered on open night at the Sundance uh, Film Festival in 2018 as the first documentary ever um, to be included in the festival's next section. 306 was released theatrically uh, through the Sundance Creative Distribution Fellowship and it is available on Amazon Prime. If you have Prime, it's there uh, for free. You can rent it for $4.99. <laughs> um, Elan also co-founded uh, the Wasaic Project and it's an, uh, she is an Emmy Award winner um, and she was nominated for the Gotham and Spirit Awards for producing Big Fan, uh, which premiered at Sundance. I have to say, and I'm going to geek out here, uh, it has, um, the actor is Pat Oswalt, and I am so jealous that Elan was uh, able to uh, work with Pat Oswalt. Uh, furthermore, uh, Elan is the co-director of El Tigre Productions, where she creates innovative nonfiction films and produces uh, digital content for organizations such as Google, MoMA, uh, The Getty, The Whitney, and The New York Times. Bienvenida, Elan. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate the intro and appreciate you all having me. And <coughs> let me just cough up at anything as, as we begin. Uh, sorry, I just grabbed something in my throat. But either way, thank you all so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. I wish I was, you know, here in person with all of you. Um, and, you know, we could really dive into all of this in its details with everything that you guys are thinking. But we'll start with the world of Zoom in this crazy and amazing last year of our lives. Um, so to get us started, uh, I'm going to share my screen. and then begin us on the journey of producing film and branded media. 
So again, thanks for joining in. Um, as we go, please add in questions into the chat. Um, there's going to be plenty of time for Q&A afterwards, and we can talk specifics about what you guys are working on, how you guys see you know, what I will be talking about, and um, how film and branded media play a role in your life. Because honestly, it is very variable in terms of how we understand it. And that's going to be a lot of the journey that we're going to be going through. So who am I? Um, Fran was able to give us a little bit of background, but in short, my name is Alain Bogarin. Um, I am currently in upstate New York. Um, I lived in Brooklyn for the last 15 years, um, and I am a film producer. Um, but again, you're going to hear lots more, basically, how, how I understand film and how I work as, as a case study. But most importantly, what I want to talk about today is the role of stories. The role of stories in my life have been everything. They're the essential component of how I understand film and branded content and media in general. Stories are what we have to understand in order to make anything, in order to communicate, in order to sell something, in order to express ourselves artistically. Stories are our bread and butter. And most importantly, when we think of stories, we, as in even you who are watching this right now, are building a story as I speak, as we live something, as a day unfolds, as the beautiful weather happens. The way in which our brains are set up is literally to actually process information into a story. When good things and or good things or bad things are happening to us, we're already beginning to develop what's the beginning? How do we see what we imagine to be the end? What are the highlights? What are the pieces of that puzzle? And that's the thing that's fascinating is that scientists have actually already understood that our brains are actually hardwired to do that. And we are literally set up to understand the world through the creation of stories. Which brings us to you guys, anyone who's watching. Who are you? How do stories play a role in your life? This goes hand in hand with two questions. Why does media, which effectively is our form of storytelling, why does it matter to you? And what do you need it for? Because despite the fact, or not despite, as we write our stories and tell our stories about our artistic careers, our pursuit of a of career in general, our sales, our media, we're understanding how these things affect us. Who are we trying to communicate to? Who are we trying to tell our stories to? And why does it matter? So effectively, again, what is it doing for you? Why do you need it? Why do we need to share? And what are you trying to share? So media, and again, more importantly, storytelling is all around us in many more places than you might imagine. And again, we're going to dive into that today. Um, the thing that I also want to point out is let's shake up sort of how we first think of media. We think of it, um, you know, in the world of media as film and branded content. It's all the ways we understand it. We think of Netflix, we think of Amazon, we think of Disney, we think of the sort of big guys. And I think it's really, really important for all of us to separate ourselves out from that kind of giant perspective of what media or branded content or commercials or any of these things that we kind of pinpoint as, okay, media is that. Media isn't necessarily me. Media and storytelling isn't necessarily my story, my life, my community. And I think we have to consistently sort of push back against the powers that be there all around us and say, actually, storytelling is everywhere we go. As in, did you have a good conversation with your mother or your spouse or your child today? You're telling a story about what you want to communicate to them. Are you trying to sell something? you know, in terms of a specific product, a specific brand, a specific piece of your business, you're telling the story of who you are, what you want to do, what you're trying to sell. But of course, what you're selling is the story of why it matters and what you understand your product to be. If you're a student and you're imagining the idea of walking to media, media begins, of course, if you think of Hollywood and you think of the big guns in New York and advertising and what have you. But the truth of it, is it is in every piece of our world, whether it be in your community, you know, again, as in what you're communicating amongst friends and family, whether it be, you know, the idea of a career, but that career in media can look a million different ways. It can be the idea of working in a community center where you tell the story of the people around you. Media, again, is far, far, far grander, and I think actually far cooler 
because of the fact that it doesn't just exist in the world of something like a Netflix or something like an Amazon, which can often feel quite untouchable. So just to get us going, let's just read a few quotes. The idea is tell our stories. We have to tell our stories because all of our stories are actually what create what matters. So one quote, and then I have this, hold on. One quote is, it's like everyone tells a story about themselves inside their own head, always, all the time. That story makes you what you are. We build ourselves out of that story. So believe in your stories and believe in the fact that you don't have to be, again, in one of the grandest places or working for a giant advertising place or something like that to believe that your story has to be crafted, told, disseminated, and brought out to the community. Another, which goes hand in hand on, you know, again, if you're thinking of the business side of this, storytelling is our obligation to the next generation. If we all um, if all we are doing is marketing, we are doing a disservice, not only to our profession, but to our children and to their children. Give something of meaning to your audience by inspiring, engaging, and educating them with story. Stop marketing, start storytelling. Again, just want to point this out because, you know, even if you're thinking about building your own audience, and we'll come to exactly kind of tips about how to do that, and whether that be social media, whether it be advertising in a more traditional sense, what have you, the point is, is that regardless, the number one thing people are talking about these days, and you'll all know this from social media, is that human stories are what honestly sell, what are shared, and what are appreciated. Human stories, authentic stories. So the key is, is that by sharing honestly, by telling things that actually matter to you, we're actually sharing in a much grander and much more important way than, again, trying to imagine that we want to be someone else or imitate something else. Another important just baseline of storytelling, and then we're gonna look at some case studies, is we often think again, or you know, something I've heard a lot as I've spoken to many people about you know, concepts of storytelling, especially within community storytelling and outside of, again, these, these crazy giant worlds of, of a Netflix, is whether or not you believe in your ability to take your own story and what you wanna communicate and adapt it. But at the same time, sometimes you're like, oh, but it's just like this or it's just like that. And it's, it's not original enough. The important part is actually just owning that approach and believing that there's a long history of all of us taking what matters to us and then telling it in a way that's just a little bit different. It doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. It just has to give a little bit of the highlight of what we know matters. So to wrap that up is ours is a highly individualized culture with a great faith in the work of art or story as a unique one-off and the artist as an original, a godlike and inspired creator of unique one-offs, but fairy tales and oral histories, the backbone of our storytelling. Fairy tales and oral histories are not like that nor are there makers and tellers? Who first invented meatballs? In what country? Is there a definitive recipe for potato soup? Think in terms of the domestic arts. This is how I make potato soup. What we want to understand and what we want to embrace is the idea that each one of us has the ability to own content and own media for ourselves. And again, you don't have to reinvent potato soup, but you just have to put in a few of your own ingredients to show why it's special to you. So with that in mind, let me give you a little bit of a case study from my life um, in terms of how I've worked in media and how I've made my own potato soup, a mix of all the things I've seen and all of the, the pieces of the puzzle in order to get a sense of how, what it means to me and then how I've told stories within that. So um, I would break my career down into sort of three different pieces. Um, I have been an artist and filmmaker. Um, and I say this again, you know, depending on if there's any students watching, um, you know, who have sort of the dreams of maybe directing features or doing that, that sort of been that category of my life. I have directed features. I've worked on the creative side where I've gotten to initiate the ideas, sell the ideas, and then produce them. I've also been a branded content producer. Um, which, you know, as you guys know, is going into a company, going into a corporation, any sort of other group where you then are told the type of content or at least the type of stories that they want to tell. 
not necessarily that you want to tell, um, though hopefully, of course, that aligns. But at the same time, you're given a directive of what that means. And then you go out and produce that type of work, um, hopefully telling it through their, their perspective, but of course, with a little bit of your spices and creativity as well. Then I've been a media strategist as well. Um, so a media strategist is where you come in using all of that knowledge of content. And basically um, I've worked with companies where I have listened to them, heard their mission and their goals. And then what you do is you give them directions for where to go, how to build their content, their social media, their websites, their branding and put it all together. Now, one question of course could be, well, why do you do all of these things? Well, first of all, it's been an interesting life, I can say that. <laughs> Another piece is that in the world of media and content, you want to understand a lot of different perspectives. And I have always been someone who, who's been fascinated by not just seeing one piece or one corner of something, but trying to see a bigger picture. Um, so part of me just always wanted to see, like, if we were to imagine content in a very holistic, very large scale, what does it look like? And then there's the practical side. Being an artist and filmmaker, sometimes pays the bills, but doesn't always pay the bills. A branded content producer and a media strategist, of course, pays the bills better. So when you put them together, basically, it just means the word sustainability. You're able to push forward and in doing so little by little advance how you actually understand the larger world of what is media, how do you understand storytelling, and how do we just look at this compilation, this sort of constellation of the meaning of, of telling stories within our society. So to break this up, I'm gonna give you some, some different pieces of the puzzle so you can get a sense of how different stories might look from these different perspectives. And we're gonna then be talking about what are the goals behind each type of different story. And the goal with this, of course, when it applies to you is for, again, we're gonna to get to a second piece of the presentation where we actually get into some tips and understanding of, well, how do we look at media? How do we consider what you wanna create? But some of it is, is also, as I know that there's a range of people watching, depending on who you want to be. Do you want to be a filmmaker, you know, and, and go out and make your own features? Do you want to promote your own business? Do you want to be, you know, again, doing something like media strategy of rebuilding a website? Each one of these examples kind of gives a different approach to that, to those different questions and those different goals, that being the most important part. So we'll start with me as artist filmmaker. This is 306 Hollywood um, is a feature film that I directed and produced and shot <laughs> um, that, I'll tell you, it basically premiered at Sundance. Um, it's currently on Amazon. It uh, was on POV on PBS um, for over 3 million people as a broadcast. We went to over 75 film festivals um, and got to travel around the world with this. But with this type of project, this is one type of storytelling. This is a much more personal storytelling. And I'm gonna have um, share, you're gonna share the trailer for that. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how it functions as a type of story. So share, yeah. When you lose someone you love, you start to look for new ways to understand the world. Let me get my glasses on. One moment they are there, they're tangible, and then the next moment they've passed. Where does your grandmother exist now that she's dead? Dig. <laughs> and when you're on an archaeological dig, you start to imagine how these people would have lived. That whiff of perfume, that splash of red lipstick on the collar, I can envision the dress a lot. Not at my age. A 
person, and especially a person that you care about, has a presence that goes far beyond their material body. Are you scared of dying? Oh, no. Oh, no, never. I'm not scared of dying at all. At 86 years of age, I think I'm very fortunate I've lived so long. Here we go, sorry. Just get my screen back up. Okay, so that was uh, the trailer for my um, feature film, 306 Hollywood. Um, and the key here is understanding what were the goals of this particular story. So again, if we're looking at this from the perspective of someone who might be a student or a professional who's working in the arts, what are the goals? The goals for a project like this are Partly I have them written up here, but to tell an artist, artistic human story, um, one of the goals for us was, you know, questioning the language of a nonfiction form um, and nonfiction film. That's sort of a bigger conversation, um, but we'll keep going. Talking about challenging topics with imagination, um, this film is about losing my grandmother. Um, so in many ways it's about grief and it's about an issue with grief and death. They're things that are hard to talk about, they're taboos. Um, but we wanted to talk about them. We thought it was important. So again, if I'm imagining making my potato soup and sort of sprinkling in the things, they were things that mattered to me. I wanted to bring this conversation into the world and I felt like it was worth it and necessary to do so. So I had to find the form within the experience of interviewing my grandmother, within making this film, within getting it out in the world um, to tell the story that personally was something that I really wanted to tell. Um, it was also my first feature that I had directed. I'd worked on various features and television and a whole range of things. Um, but for me, it was also something that I wanted to build an audience and sort of create the conversation around the type of filmmaking that I was interested in for my artistic pursuits. So again, goals. What are the goals of each type of media or each type of content that you wanna, you wanna create? Those were very much the goals. I can go into so many, you know, again, if there's questions about goals about why does one make a feature, feel free to ask um, and get into any specifics. But the other piece of this puzzle is who do you reach and where? With every single type of content, you're gonna have two pieces of the puzzle. What are the goals behind it? Are you selling something? Are we communicating something personal? Are we looking at a community to try to express its goals? Are we doing something political? What are we doing? You wanna find a place to actually put it, a find a place that that conversation can be initiated. So we're gonna look for possible distribution routes as well. With something like this, we, again, reached more than 3.5 million people in our run um, with streaming platforms of Amazon in theaters. We did a 25 city tour in festivals. Again, there were 75 festivals around the world. Um, broadcast TV was through PBS, um, through web, you know, a mix of streaming, various platforms, including um, educational platforms, et cetera, and social media. So you're trying to find a balance between these two pieces of the puzzle um, in terms of, again, goals for where, what kind of story, and again, where are the people that you actually want to reach in order to tell, to tell that story, in order to have those conversations. So this is, again, the artistic component. Let's go to something, again, as I guess as some people might say, as maybe my mother would say, a more practical approach to branded content. So again, as I mentioned before, branded content um, might apply directly to many of you if you're running businesses. If you're running businesses, if you're trying to promote something, what you're trying to do is tell, is use storytelling, the use the characters within the story, to use the things that you're showing on screen to indicate a brand, to tell how this represents you. 
So one thing I did, and we're going to watch it, is I worked for Google, um, and they created a series called Search On that was aiming to use stories to effectively tell who they were. Um, they, much of branded content, especially these days, um, something that's pro quite popular, it's basically making branded content content that doesn't look like branded content. So as you might know, if you've, you know, again, ever watched media, and we're thinking about commercials, commercials can be very much a jingle that's directly for a product, you repeat the name of the product a million times, it's all about the characteristics of that product. That's one type of branded media. Another type of branded media has sort of a softer branded media that again, has positives and negatives. Of course, we have to think about the implications of, you know, again, trying to be clear with our audience and not trying to say something that we're not trying to say, but really one of the most popular ways these days is to use media that again, is sort of a soft branding where what it's doing is it's finding other people's stories that aren't necessarily of their company or of their product. And by telling them, again, it's expressing who they are, the company's brand, their mission, their approach, um, but in a way that you wouldn't necessarily first think that. So again, let's watch this um, short video that I did for them that is exactly within that sort of soft branded content world where we wanted to tell a beautiful story about a remarkable young woman, um, Katanjali Rao, who is, is the main character of this little short. Um, and in doing so, we are communicating the wonders of Google. So Shara, let's check that one out. Is this one open storage? No, this is the episode eight. I heard about the Zika virus outbreak and I wanted to use gene editing techniques to help prevent this from happening. And then I heard about Malaysian Airlines going missing. So I created a black... What's that? We didn't actually start that from the beginning. Okay, sorry. Thanks. No, don't worry. I often look at the news to find problems around the world. I heard about the Zika virus outbreak and I wanted to use gene editing techniques to help prevent this from happening. And then I heard about Malaysian Airlines going missing. So I created a black box finder, but then I found out about Flint, which was one of the biggest problems I'd ever seen. My name is Katanjali Rao. I'm a scientist and an inventor. <laughs> Flint switched their water source from Lake Huron to the Flint River, which caused lead contamination in drinking water. The part that hit me the most was that there are all these children who don't deserve unclean water to drink. I wouldn't want that to happen to me or my family, so why should it happen to them? I saw my parents testing for lead and other contaminants in our drinking water, and it wasn't reliable, it was inconvenient. The current test for lead can take up to two weeks. That is quite expensive, and it's very laborious to get a result. So what I wanted to do is create a lead and water detection tool. I came across this new technology using carbon nanotube sensors and wanted to expand the idea to detect lead in drinking water. In the beginning, I wasn't even sure if this idea would even work. I needed guidance and I needed a lab. When I met Kitanjali, I thought that she conducts herself pretty much like an adult. She's combining the skills of an engineer, of a scientist, of a designer. So we decided to partner up with her because we have a common goal to provide safe drinking water. When they offered me the lab space, I come home and I start screaming my head off. It's like, ah, or something like that. I was so excited. I knew that if I could get this to work, I could help so many residents of Flint. My device is named Tethys after the Greek goddess of fresh water. To create Tethys, I went through a lot of different versions, and now it's a 3D printed, fully wired device. In order to test for lead in your water using Tethys, you attach a disposable lead sensor cartridge specially treated with chloride ions. 
If the water has lead, it sticks to the chloride ions and causes resistance to the flow of current. So the more resistance, the more lead. To display the results, I wanted to create an app. So I used Android App Maker because that's what was easiest for me for my first time creating an app. I connected the device to the phone using Bluetooth and I could see my results of either safe, slightly contaminated, or critical. It's, she's, she's just amazing. She's taking advantage of that knowledge and that passion to build something that is for the benefit of humanity. Coming to Flint just makes me want to work harder. People are lined up for hours waiting to get bottled water, which won't even last them a whole month. I know my device only solves a small part of this huge problem, but if people can test their water themselves, that gives them the power to do something about it. Society tells you that you can't do certain things because you're a child or because you are a female. Seeing someone like Jitanjali, so eager, so smart, so prepared, she's pushing the envelope, not only for herself, but for other generations to come. Four years, I'll support the whole world. Four years, I'll Okay, I think picture. All right, back to me. Um, so sorry that I don't know if everyone saw that it was a little jumpy in terms of how it was playing. Um, but the key here, the takeaway is for you all is trying to think of if you want to tell stories around you, what stories in your community represent your values, your missions, your goals? You want to think of which amazing people, students, children, as Gitanjali is, um, people within your community, um, people within your team, in your business, represent your mission. Um, how do you humanize it? Um, so again, if we're looking at goals, in my goal with my feature, it was to try to figure out how to have a conversation um, and look for ways of using a personal story to tell something bigger. That could be a conversation about artistic practices of how to tell nonfiction um, to how do we talk about grief, to how do we talk about death, how do we talk about family and what remains in what remains of us and the people we love based in, in the objects around us. So how is the ordinary extraordinary? That's if we're looking at my project for this one. And again, with branded content of this form, again, we're looking to our community, to individuals, to people who can represent our brand. So it's a different type of thing. One is to create a conversation. Um, they both are creative conversation, but it's sort of a little bit of a shift. Mine was to, again, use personal stories, create a conversation. This kind of branded content is using personal stories, but necessarily that are outside of our own, our own world in order to say something so much grander about something like Google. Um, so in terms of the reach of that, um, again, if we're thinking about where does a story like that get placed, is that online, almost 7 million people watch this just within, you know, one social media video um, on YouTube. Um, it also had extensive, extensive social media events and conferences, all to create conversations about the role of Google, the way in which it understands who matters to them, and how they want to bring um, a story like a 15 year old who invented a water, you know, uh, something that would that could test lead in water, how that again affects and and contains their mission. So again, you can also do similar things where you look at an amazing person um, in any part of your world, um, create some sort of content and media around them and then connect it to what you're doing and then effectively using it as part of your brand telling stories. There's another case study in terms of sort of, again, me <laughs> broken into parts is me as media strategist. So for many years, I worked for um, a company um, called the Colección Patricia Phipps de Cisneros, the Cisneros Collection. Um, it's one of the largest and most important collections of art in Latin America. Um, it was founded by a, a woman named Patricia Phelps de Cisneros, who basically from the 70s on believed that art from Latin America wasn't being looked at as 
favor favorably or positively as art that was made in the US or Europe, um, especially in relationship to mid-century geometric abstraction. And she set her goal to change that. So she started to collect it. She started to try to educate it, get it into museums, et cetera. By the time I came on board um, in the early um, aughts, um, what they were trying to do is take this online to basically say, let's create an international community around this kind of artwork and also give credence and perspective to art and ideas from Latin America. So again, equivalently, is maybe you guys have something that people are overlooking. People aren't giving the appropriate amount of attention for what you feel it deserves. This is kind of one of those models where what we did is we were looking at okay, what does that mean? If we found, if we have a, a story or stories of, for in this case, Latin American art that is being, that are being overlooked, how do we get people's eyes on them? So we ended up creating a new website for them. We created multiple videos for them that would tell individual stories and profiles of people who were generally unknown, who weren't put into the art historical context that they deserved, that weren't being given their due. Um, we did an enormous amount of social media push and social media marketing. Um, so we ended up building their social media platforms effectively from zero to tens of thousands of followers. Um, all of with the goal in terms of storytelling of the idea of saying, let's focus on things that aren't focused on usually, but then find ways to actually build a platform. Again, media, media being website, uh, again, media, website, content, social media that actually gives all of this type of conversation, a place, a home, so anyone who's interested in it can engage specifically in these stories, um, but also, again, actually activates people's knowledge. It's saying, okay, you didn't know about this artist? Well, now you do. So in a moment, let's watch just one video we created for them, a profile of an artist that was generally unknown that should have been, and you know, afterwards we felt was part of the conversation. Um, that is another form of storytelling, another way to use content. So Shara, if we can play this next video, that would be great. How can an artist show us time? Beginning on January 1st, 2003, and continuing throughout the year, the Colombian artist José Antonio Suárez Londoño made a series of notes, drawings, and annotations in three notebooks that he kept detailing his reading of Ovid's Metamorphoses. He called his artwork a yearbook, and it shows us overlapping visions of time. We see the ancient mythic time of Ovid's stories of transformation. Martes, 11 de marzo. Son of Agenor, why stare at the snake you have slain? You too will become a serpent for men to gaze upon. We see art historical time in drawings that Suarez Londoño makes of other artists' work. Here's a page with a beautiful little figure from Titian in the upper right corner. Breaking news of the day is woven together with observations from the artist's daily life. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave the country within the next 48 hours. GWB, Anoche. Each kind of time that he depicts coincides and overlaps with many others. On the 26th of June, he listed some of the colors he dropped on this page. Windsor Violet, Phocian Purple, and Folger's French Vanilla Cafe. Each kind of time that he depicts overlaps and coincides with many this is exactly the type of chance event that Suarez Londoño welcomes 
If something spills, if a color bleeds through, if a child decides to draw on one of his notebooks, it becomes part of the artwork and another depiction of time. So that was just one of the zillions of pieces of content we produced for them. Again, we ended up creating every piece of their world um, from their brand to their logo, to their um, website, to their social media, to their content. That was just one that I always kind of got a kick out of. Um, but I think here, again, in terms of you know goals, we're looking at the what were they trying to achieve and then where do they put it? Um, but you know the goal for them was again, build an international community, create a conversation where the people who are interested in that international community could commune and actually find each other. And then the question is, how do we tell their story? On what platforms? How to make the content that the audience needed? Um, when we think of this, and again, connect it to what you guys are doing um, or could be doing, is you want to be looking at what is your goal for something like this? What kind of conversation are you trying to create? And then within that, where can we find platforms for it? We're going to get specifically momentarily into breaking that down, but as just another example, this one ended up reaching, you know, over a million people um, through a combination of, again, their website and social media, of course, but then they also had many connections to museums where we would show content from it, have conversations there, art fairs, which connected into all the artists that we were working with, and then again, you know, conferences that were having conversations in relationship to these particular questions and, and communities. So what connects all of this? If we're looking at sort of the way that I've worked in all of these different pieces of the puzzle, it's storytelling. Um, storytelling is the essential component. It's understanding that for every community, for every business, for every um, art student, for every filmmaker or professional artist, what we're looking at is what story do we personally want to tell? What stories are we being hired to tell? What stories are we trying to understand in order to get more attention for things that deserve it? Um, we're looking at the many ways that stories function and then the many, many ways in which they're consumed. So of course, then it's where do your stories live? We all have these stories. Again, it's like, as, as we've, we've mentioned, there's the whole range of people who I think are watching and connect, connect to this is that our stories are multiple and we don't wanna underestimate the power of what we need to tell and who needs to hear it. So we can have personal stories, we can have business stories, we can have community stories, we can have sales stories, um, meaning also telling stories of what has happened to us. We sold this much, we had these kind of successes, we made this kind of artwork and want to report on it. We are politically trying to engage X number of people. Memory stories are, there's someone who has come before, there's a history that has existed. There's, there's the stories of, again, uh, a block on, uh, that, that we live on that deserves to be told because something interesting happened there. Each one of these pieces of those stories, you want to investigate of saying they're all around us. Again, it's not the big guys. It's not a Netflix. It doesn't have to be. What matters is that we're looking at the individual stories that affect us most and affect the community that we're dealing with um, and affect you know, the bigger pictures of, again, what we're, we're fighting for, what we believe in, what we want our children to, to know about and have a record of. All of these play a role in us understanding where our stories live, which story should be told, and then of course, which stories we can use, and I'll say it blank, you know, bluntly, but to our benefit. What stories represent our own personal brand as an individual, as a freelancer, as an artist, as a, as a global brand, like a Google, you know, as, as a smaller, or it's not actually very small, but you know, as, as a Latin American art collection, you know, we're looking for the stories that relate to us, that represent us. Excuse me, and I'm pregnant and I apologize. I am 
coughing and <laughs> um, but yes, all of these stories are how we communicate who we are and they're the essential components to then how we can achieve what we want. So big picture, storytelling goals. We have to understand the why. Why on earth do you need to tell your story? Do you need to meet a sales goal? As we've said, sales goal, remember something, create a conversation, create a political action, create what? So understanding the why, essential component. Understanding the why one step deeper. And this is sort of the twist to it that we're gonna talk about in a moment. But why does your community need your story? And why do you need them? We're gonna to get to this in a moment, but it's not just about you. When you think about your stories, you wanna be as broad and imaginative and look as far and as wide as you can go to think of the stories that represent you. But you also wanna know what does your community need when thinking of you? It's not just about you, you, you. It's about saying, what can you share? What can you offer them? What, how are you useful? How are you bringing something to something they relate to? And that leads us to the understanding of what stories and content will you create? Because between that combination of the two, then you can begin to pinpoint, okay, this is the kind of story. This is the role model that someone's looking for. This is the um, emotional moment that someone wants to share. And then you can start to you know, dial in, or even this is the review of the product. This is the review of the product. This is the essential component of why you need my business. That's how you piece the, the combination together in order to say, okay, yes, let's make that type of content. And then of course, you know, top six reasons of why you wanna tell your story. You know, and again, the why will change. But as we've said, one, because we wanna bring the stories that need to be told into the world. We don't wanna let the people who don't know about our communities and don't know about us individually as artists or as business people or, you know, what have you, we don't want them to leave us out. You know, we don't want to give the power to everyone else. We want to be able to share what we know matters. So that is, I think, an essential component. Another, of course, is grow your influence or build a career. Grow your influence. You know, most people, we all have a lot to think about and we have a lot of points of attention that are, or things that are trying to pull our attention. Um, if you don't tell your story at all, you are, of course, not being part of that conversation. You're allowing all, you know, all the other chatter boxes to kind of get everyone else's attention. But within your community, if you want to create content and you want to be, you know, again, trying to sort of come to, to, this, to the top, then part of it is that you want to tell your story to grow your influence, have people know who you are, know what you do, or if it's an individual to, again, build the beginning of a career, grow your career so that people know that, you know, again, you're someone who's worth putting attention on. Of course, that goes hand in hand, which stories are an amazing PR tool. And of course, with the dawn and you know much development of social media at this point, honestly, it's kind of the best and closest to a free-ish PR marketing tool. Um, of course, it's not free because if you really want to reach people, then you do have to pay marketing fees, even again, in the world of Facebook and Instagram and all of that. But at the same time, beginning to build an audience and telling your story is your own means of PR and your own means of empowering yourself. And again, your personal story, your business story. It also, what you're doing is you wanna create some sort of fan base. And this goes for anyone. Again, you as an individual creator or as a business, your fans are your people who, it's your audience, it's your consumers, it's you know the people who love you the most. You want to stay in their minds and you want to be giving them content that consistently feeds their understanding of who you are. So it's going to help create that relationship. Of course, throughout all of this, again, expanding your visibility. And, you know, in the same way that I would say my two examples with Google and the C. Snails collection is you're defining your brand. Who are you? What stories represent you? What stories mean the most to you? And then hopefully that resonates dramatically with those fans who you're talking to because those stories mean something to them as well. So it's a back and forth. So as we've mentioned as well, um, but again, crucial note, stories aren't all about you. You have to think about what does someone want to hear? What is useful, human, and authentic? What actually offers something to someone's life? So again, is someone learning something? 
Um, that's why reviews are, are so, why they matter so much in the world of social media and, and everything of Amazon of whatever. It's that it's feedback into something that's useful. Are we teaching? Are we learning? Are we learning about a new place, a new artist, a new shop, a new restaurant? Human, that's sort of all the popular things of humans of New York or, or honestly just what resonates most on social media, things that are authentic, things that tell a truth that might be hard to admit yourself. You wanna think about those kind of stories, those stories that help connect you to someone else where it's not just saying, check me out. It's not just saying, you know, watch this, buy this. It's actually trying to say behind that, these are the stories that matter. And the other thing, of course, as we've said in the same way that I was looking at my goals for each one of my projects and then where they go is that you have to find a platform where they can be heard. And I think the thing is, is that of course we know, you know, social media is the easiest possible way for all of us in this current day and age. But I think it's really important to also remember that you can go far and wide and be far more creative. Social media is sort of an entry point to all of these things. But newsletters and email blasts are actually one of the most useful ways of getting in touch with people at the moment. Um, you know, I think people undersell them because of the fact that it feels old fashioned, but honestly, the closer you can get to sort of the day-to-day -day life of an individual, an individual, the better off you are. So actually email blasts and newsletters, when you have that relationship with people who care about what you're doing are actually surprisingly, surprisingly effective. Um, there's always traditional advertising on every scale of, you know, local advertising to national advertising, um, and it's important to keep in mind that whole um, range, because basically you're thinking about, again, where does your content need to land, but specifically, who are individuals and where are they finding them within your direct community? Um, we don't need to think, we don't have to compete with Nike or, you know, an Amazon. It's like, that's not what we need, what we wanna find are groups and communities, community organizations, nonprofits, et cetera, who are working in spaces that connect to what you're trying to do and you wanna to try to actually reach them. What are their newsletters? What are their organizations? What are the places they go to? So press, of course, of just getting press on media on things that you've done is also another form of content. Um, and then you wanna think about what kind of storytelling do you wanna give to the press? Do you wanna create in order for the press to cover um, that links up to your type of storytelling? Community events, another way of understanding storytelling and content because those community events create the stories and create how you imagine, you know, how, how other people see you and how other people tell your stories. So again, it's that combination of you creating something but it's the feedback, what do people need and what do people want? And then there's just the day-to-day -day of interaction with clients and customers. Stories connect to how we just tell our story, how we talk about ourselves, how we think of ourselves. So stories go deep. You know, it's every level of it. It's it's the person who greets you at the door. Um, it's you know, if you're a student, how you walk into an interview, and you know how we think of a cover letter. You know, the range of storytelling goes from the very beginning of an interaction all the way to the end, and it doesn't even have to be a piece of created content. It just is something where. That's how you actually told your story and people remember that. So storytelling in effect is just this multi-layered constant piece of the puzzle of how we are communicating with each other, you know, and whether or not you're engaged specifically with making a piece of content that can be played online or screened at a theater is sort of only the very tip of the tip of the iceberg of, of understanding what filmmaking, honestly, and even branded content is, let alone what any of the forms of, of, of media can be. Um, it's really anytime you want to think about this, you want to think outside of the box. Where, where do stories live from the beginning of your day to the end of the day? And how can you find a way to control some component of that so you can tell the story about yourself, you know, who you are, what you're doing in the way that you feel comfortable best represents you and then hopefully reaches the communities and people that you hope to reach. So you as storyteller, inside each of us is a natural born storyteller waiting to be released. And I believe that entirely because again, you know, the moment you stop watching this, you'll have a story about what did you learn or what did you think or what did you see? The moment you step outside on 
what I think is, is a beautiful day for me. I think it's a beautiful day for you guys too. You'll be talking about the story of what the day was like, the dinner you will hopefully have a little later tonight. Um, each one of us has the ability to own the stories we have. And then again, find that, that combination of goal, why are we telling it, who do we wanna reach? And then hopefully finding partners of where we can actually release those stories and get them out into the world so they're heard. And then stories constitute the single most powerful weapon in a leader's arsenal. A leader can be a leader of any variety, including of yourself, but stories are what actually allow us to find our place. So as that, I am gonna wrap up with my hour. I'm right on time. Um, but you know, ask any question about any part of my career, um, about you know, how you could possibly use storytelling, where it's found and the goals you might have. Um, I wanted to keep this broad in some ways because again, we're not specifically looking at social media or you know, the different types of, of specific you know, forms, but it's again, it's about sort of imagining broadly that if you wanna work in media or if you wanna use media to your advantage, there's an enormous amount of opportunity and possibility, you know, in every aspect of our lives. So then it's about just trying to pinpoint them and then find out what needs to be created, even if it's just, again, a beautiful way of expressing an elevator pitch of, of who you are and what you do. That is just as much the important part of branded content as I would say is making a video. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and see if there are any questions. Um. Elan, I was just going to say um, thank you so much. And we could, I, I put a couple questions in there um, just to give people a little time if they want to put in a question. But um, I know that this has been an amazing talk. Thank you so much. And I, I, um, I know that our students will watch this at some point, even if they weren't able to be here today. So I wondered if, you know, of those various questions I threw at you, if you could talk about your advice for students when they're getting started, like if they're going to be producing film or branded media, what do you think is the most important thing for them to spend their time doing? Is my video working? Yeah, okay. Um, I think for students, there's a few pieces of the puzzle. One is you wanna think through, well, oh, two ways to look at it. Okay, so let's start again with that. For students, I think there's a few ways. What I would advise is trying to work for some other companies, work for some companies where you see brand and content in action. Basically, what you want to be exposed to, if you were to work for someone, or the second option is doing this yourself, where you use case studies and imagine this process, is really what you're trying to do is walk yourself through the process of, what, of going backwards. Where do you think that media came from? Branded content always has a mission. It's usually to sell something. Um, but it has the mission of selling something within the parameters of the, the, the goals of, of a company. So what you want to look at is you want to look at media and analyze it yourself. Where do you think they started? What was their goal? Why did they use the story they used? And then does it or does it not succeed? So just that analysis alone is going to give you so much information about how to understand what's being crafted. You can either do this again by getting an internship, working somewhere, being the one who's creating the content. Sometimes you just dive in. But you have to sort of see that bigger picture because it's not exactly the media itself. It's the story behind the media that is actually where the whole thing stems from. And then of course the craft of filmmaking is about figuring out how to then actually execute that into shot by shot and you know, video by video. Thank you. Uh, Sarah has soon has a question in the q and I don't know if you can see that there. I can, I just saw it. It's the experience with camera work. Um, yes, I have shot tremendously. Um, I at first wanted to be a director of photography as a cinematographer. Um, in terms of getting into camera operating, a lot of this is the same sort of concept. You want to, you know, see, this is where you generally have to be in one of the larger media spaces because you want to work actively in the film industry. Um, so, you know, Atlanta is doing fantastically with film um, New York, LA, of course, but there's many, many other regional areas, Atlanta being an amazing one that's consistently growing. Um, 
And what you want to do is you want to be working in a rental house. So a camera rental equipment house. That's one possibility where you'll learn about this and meet more and more cinematographers, in which case you might be brought on as a camera intern um, or a camera PA production assistant. Um, and basically then you start working up and starting to meet more people where you have the chance to jump in and work on larger productions. However, on the smaller term, I would say, make sure you have a camera and make sure you're shooting as much as you possibly can. So you learn how to be an amazing camera operator because another possibility is short changing that whole route and making an amazing reel of saying, here's what I've shot. Here's my camera operating or cinematography skills and showing people a reel. And then someone just hires you directly on. So there's sort of two paths that you could go down. Awesome. Thank you so much. I thought I'd come out of disembodied voice mode for a second. Um, so if I could just, um, you know, we'll give people one last chance to throw in any questions, but um, use this opportunity to ask you juicy questions about your own career. <laughs> but my, other, <laughs> my other questions were um, if there was something that you want, really want to do, but haven't had a chance to yet in terms of a kind of media or certain content you're interested in looking at. And I was also um, curious if there's something you've just said, nope, um, you know, when you talked about your own brand and stories that are meaningful to you if people have said will you do this and you said I mean maybe you wouldn't be specific about the the entity but something you said I'm just not not willing to do that for, for whatever reason I'd say the biggest puzzle with staying a working professional filmmaker when you want to make your own work as well the biggest issue is sustainability um, you know so again this sort of puzzle that I've created of doing all of these different pieces um, of, of the media pie in part has been my means of being a sustainable artist of, you know, it means that if you're paid well for one thing, you can take off more time for the next and then pursue getting your projects made. And then you go back and forth and you keep flipping between wearing hats um, in order to, you know, pay the bills. And, and just, you know, of course the fun part of it is, is working with new people and getting the chance to be part of different things. But honestly, if we wanna boil it down, one of the cruxes of it is simply that, some pay better and some pay worse. And you're going to find that balance in order to just keep living your life and having a family and paying your bills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think there's a lot of things at this point that I've turned down. Um, <laughs> I would say that um, I've turned things down, I would say almost more for time. Well, no, that's not true. There are projects that we all want more than others. Um, I think the challenge that goes in hand in hand, if one of, if, if students are watching and are talking about working in film is film is a very intensive, very long hour, very travel heavy project. Um, I, for many years, actually loved a lot of that. And I worked all the time and I traveled whenever I could travel. And I now have a one and a half year old daughter and I am currently pregnant and my life has changed very dramatically. Um, so I would say that my recent experiences with turning things down, other than the pandemic, which of course has reshifted everything for everyone, um, is more to do with the question of how to work in film of I can't travel as extensively, I can't be away for weeks at a time or even many days at a time at the moment, and I can't work 14 hour days. Um, all of those things, I was just offered two commercial projects for two actually, you know, if I was excited about it. It's, it's big campaigns for getting people vaccinated um, that are going to be aired on broadcast TV. And it actually be very cool, but it would have been an entirely encompassing um, for basically six weeks. And at the very moment, I just can't do that. So for me, a lot of, a lot of it is content and media go hand in hand with how does your life style work at any given time. And I think that that's something that maybe some students might shortchange because it's going to be a question of where do you want to live? What do you want to do? And are you willing to work those hours? And for many years, the answer for me was very much yes. But right now things have shifted a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that means I didn't ask your sec answer your second question. Um, and then second question is, um, yeah, is there something I really want to do? Um, I want to make another feature or another series, and we are in the process of hopefully doing that. Um, and yeah, we just got a very exciting development deal with, um, I don't, I, 
we'll keep this some, it, with an amazing company. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll pursue that and kind of hit, you know, hit the ground running with the next project. Awesome. That's so exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, so Chelsea put in the chat because she's a, one of the moderators can't, you know, put it in the Q and A, but she said, can you see that? I can add it. Uh, blah, 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 blah. How do filmmakers, creators build community outside of major film centers and cities? So I think that that is an essential part of why it matters to be creative about what media means. Media, when looked at from a narrow perspective, has some, I wouldn't even say straightforward, they're still not straightforward, but slightly more straightforward paths. As in, you do just start working on, you know, feature films that are in the Hollywood systems and that's one path. And there are, you know, unions that you can join or, you know, try to join that can directly push you into that. You can work in television. Those are going to tend to be in certain places um, in the major, you know, the major cities. Um, and we know most of them. Um, there are smaller ones again. And I would like to really say though, Atlanta has been growing and growing and is fabulous. So within your region, at least, that's an amazing place to be right now. Um, again, outside of the pandemic, pandemic throws things into the air, but back in the next little while, I assume it will kind of be what it, what it was. I think that by understanding media to be more broadly positioned, that media can be anything from, you know, again, creating web videos to creating sales videos, to creating personal videos, to having blogs and having, you know, different types of media for smaller companies and whether it be company, whether it be a community center, whether it be, you know, organizations that are directly within your community, it's not shortchanging that to perceive that as part of the media landscape. It is part of the media landscape. It is a different path. It doesn't take you on the same necessarily career path, but at the same time, it directly puts you in line with the same values, with the same skill set, with the same process as media in a sort of more traditional minded ways. And I think that's how you can really find a space for yourself in more local um, environments than the traditional ones. Awesome. Thank you. You have two other questions in the Q&A. Um, Jamie Bennett asks you, um, well, first she said 306 Hollywood was exquisite. I agree, Jamie. Any advice on working with family or storytelling within the realm of the personal? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's important to remember if you're working personally that you, this is a strange way to understand it, but that the people you're filming, even if it is your parents or your siblings or your grandparents, are characters when made into a film. When you're filming, you're you. You're you with them in your personal environments that are incredible, that you have that access, that you have those relationships for good or for bad, that you have those environments to have those conversations. But the truth of it is when you turn it into a film, the challenge for all of us is, it's not to divorce yourself, but it's to look at that footage as footage, not necessarily as your relationship or here's me and my mom, here's my, you know, this is my story with this person. It's about the fact that it actually is a story. It is a story that you're telling that you're communicating to somebody else. So a lot of it is having that challenge to yourself, that discipline to sort of push yourself back and say, what is interesting to someone outside of my family or outside of my personal sphere? What is unique? What is special? Or what is communicating something that's a more universal story than we might have um, at the get-go? What about your relationship or your experience is representing something bigger, is representing a theme beyond just you, that is representing um, you know, effectively a mission or, or, or something that's, that's past us individually? You know, is it about a challenge in the community? Is it about uh, environmental issue? Is it about um, relationships, but kind of relationships that your relationship is representative of how many people might relate to their parents or their siblings or what, you know, their friends, what have you, or to a subculture, to a music culture, to a skating culture, to a um, political action culture. You want to find the way to see beyond what you are experiencing to make your story read bigger. 
Awesome. Are you ready for one last question for, sure. for the afternoon? Okay. Um, so is it helpful if I read that to you? Just so you can, it's under under the q and I'll, I'll read it so everyone can hear in case they can't see it. But yeah, Mary no. Baker says, I'm really torn about which marketing direction to take. As my interests are in designing and analytics, I find my view through a camera very fun as well. Where's the best direction class-wise to begin? I'm currently taking a social media marketing course and I'm going to begin a series interviewing local vets regarding feline diseases. You did a beautiful job and I appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm trying to think marketing direction. Okay, so it's my interests are in designing and analysis. The key here is and, and honestly, I would say, Mary, that you're very lucky because if you feel directed and you know that you want to work in marketing and analysis, that's already pretty exciting and has a path to follow. As in most companies need something like this. Most places of business need someone like you, um, of who hopefully you will end up becoming. Um, I would try to take honestly, as many classes you can to give yourself a wide variety of information. Social media marketing is a job that is more and more and more popular that everyone needs. Uh, it's basically community managers, it's often termed. Um, if you wanna work in designing and analysis though, the key components are just trying to get a bigger picture of what business components are you interested in. Of course, if you wanna actually literally design, you need to have those skills and the knowledge of the software and understanding of more artistic practices of what are you bringing to it. Um, analysis has multiple pieces to it and, and can go in many different directions, but basically marketing as a category has many different types of pieces to it. You wanna understand the wide breadth of it as a student, especially because when you get a job, you will you will focus, you'll have to focus because that will be your job. And you will be given the tools and sort of the background to learn on the job of what needs to be done specifically for a company. But if you have sort of a bigger understanding of what is the arc of what marketing does and how it fits into a company itself and what possibilities are offered with that, I think you'll be in a pretty good spot. You know, a lot of it is gonna come from on the job training. Um, but if you have a background so that you know the terms and you know the general parameters of why someone might be having you do one task or another, you'll be in great shape. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elan. I'm going to ask um, Chelsea and Matt if they're if they're there to join us and maybe Fran, if she, Dr. Canedo, if she would like to say goodbye. Um, but thank you so much. What a, a wonderful presentation. Thanks for sharing your beautiful work. Um, you know, I love 306 Hollywood, but also the other work is so beautiful, too. Um, and I rarely feel that excited about branded media, you know, but it's especially lush and gorgeous. It has your 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 touch for sure. So um, thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Canedo, for um, introducing Elan. Um, it was so nice of you to take this time on this Saturday afternoon. Lovely. Appreciate you both so much. Thanks to my colleagues, Chelsea and Matt. Um, this has been a wonderful first symposium. I'm really thrilled about it all. Thanks so much to our audience. Um, we've had a I think uh, Mary Baker was at most of it <laughs> um, and, and, and a lot of other folks have joined us from all over. So thank you so much. Um, we wish you a, a good summer. I wish you the best and, uh, and really appreciate everyone. Anything you want to say, Chelsea or Matt? No, just thanks everyone <laughs> for coming. That's all I got. <laughs> Not Matt, and Matt's nodding. That's it. Thank you. That's thanks, it. everyone. Thank you. Right, so, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to the whole team. Really appreciate being here and, and hope that was helpful. And obviously for anyone who is interested, um, you know, I'm another resource out there um, and, you know, can always be asked questions or, or what have you. Um, but that's actually one other piece of advice, you know, reach out to the people who are interesting to you. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like all of us are just individuals kind of chugging away, trying to do our best. So we're all in this together. Um, and that's, you know, one of the other pieces of advice in media, but really such a pleasure to be talking to everyone. Thank you so much. And yeah, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. We've got lots of, um, notes in, in chat. People are, are appreciating you. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much, Alan. Bye-bye.